Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Marjorie Sussman, and I'm a shareholder here at Davis Mom. And I want to be probably the 17th person to welcome you here and say good morning and thank you for coming. And I think especially in addition to coming out so early in the morning, you've come out to hear about a topic that's often very uncomfortable or awkward to talk about. And so I give you extra points for that. Um, for those of you that I don't know, I'm a trust and estates lawyer. And over the many years I've been practicing, I've drafted hundreds and hundreds of healthcare proxies. And if I drafted yours, you may remember that I told you that your healthcare agent's job is to make healthcare decisions on your behalf if you are unable to make or communicate those decisions. And if you're acting as someone's healthcare agent, then you may know that um, this is not supposed to be what we call a substituted judgment standard where the agent decides based on what the agent thinks is in your best interest or what the agent would want for themselves. The agent is supposed to do what the principal would do if the principal could make the decision. And obviously, that can only happen if the agent has enough information to make the decision that you would make if you could make it. So when I have this conversation with my clients, I usually get this back. Oh, my daughter knows that I want her to pull the plug. And I always think to myself, well, if it were really that simple and the agent only had to make one decision at the very end of whether to pull the plug, I mean, that would be painful, but it would be relatively simple. Um, but that isn't what usually happens. Unless you have a catastrophic event, the agent is going to have to make a series of decisions, sometimes over a long period of time. And it could be something like, that you might have you know, mild dementia, but a very nice quality of life, and the agent has to decide whether you should have dialysis or aggressive treatment for cancer. And um, the frustration for me over the years has been that I can't draft a healthcare proxy that would cover all those contingencies. And even if I could, probably a year later, they'd have some new medical technology or your life circumstance may have changed, and you wouldn't um, you would change your mind about whether a certain treatment was agreeable to you or not. So yesterday, I met actually with a woman who was in her early 50s, and she said to me, well, I'm very active and outdoorsy, and it's really important to me. So if something happened to me and I had to be in a wheelchair, I really wouldn't want to live. So I said, well, what about you know if you were 80 <laughs> and something happened to you and you uh, you know you were cognizant and you were still having a decent life and she said well if I were 80 then maybe I wouldn't mind living in a wheelchair so that that just illustrates how th you can't have a document that covers all these contingencies the only way that this is going to really work out so that your end of life plan really comes to fruition is if you have an ongoing conversation and dialogue with the agent where um, you uh, express your wishes and how, uh, on how you want the end of your life uh, to play out. So um, this has become more complicated recently because of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act because most of us actually don't know what our health care options are going to be in the future. And that's why I have asked Diane to come and speak to us this morning. So Diane is the founder and principal of Health Assist, and I am the president of the Diane Savistano um, fan club <laughs> because I've worked with her with a number of clients and also with a family member. And um, she's totally amazing. Her bio is in your materials, and so I'm not going to read it, but I do want to attest to the um, that this, to the truth of this statement in her bio, that Diane offers expert help in demystifying healthcare and medical insurance and provides customized services that help individuals and families navigate the complexities of the healthcare system. 
So without further ado. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Marjorie. It's really a, a pleasure to be here to begin the Health, Wealth, and Wisdom series. And I hope you attend the other two events that are coming up in October and November as well. Um, what I, uh, what my objective for today is really to encourage you all to have conversations. And those conversations really should be about um, your health care, because um, I want you to think about that from this, uh, from your perspective, um, the health care of people that you might love and or help manage in your life. And I also want you to have conversations, again, surrounding end of life issues, considering yourself and considering those that you care for. Um, the, the second objective is to be sure that everyone you know, has advanced directives in place, again, for yourself, for those you care for, um, and for people you might be able to influence, such as clients or friends or family members. Um, I'm always excited to talk about uh, this topic uh, for some really personal reasons, well, one of which is because I deal with this every day in my, you know, my life's work, which I'm very, very passionate about as I'm helping people navigate this very complex system that we all have to live within. Um, but also, um, I'm sort of in the midst of living what many of you might be living in that I have parents who are 79 and 80. Um, they're quite healthy at this point. They're independent. However, I am an only child and I will be it. So we have lots of conversations and I joke with them and tell them it's in my best interest to keep them as healthy as possible <laughs> because it affects my life. But when it comes time to, having make, de to make decisions, um, we've had a lot of discussion about that. Another reason um, is that I just in the past couple of months lost my father-in-law and he was 89. And I thought that we as a family were unprepared despite what I do. But I have to say that he at least had his documentation in order. And as a result, it was a great springboard for us to have to make some pretty immediate decisions within a three-week illness in passing. And then lastly, um, you know, I have a husband who's about eight years older than me, so I'm anticipating I'm going to live longer than he is. I'm anticipating I might have to make decisions for him, but I'm also worried about who's going to take care of me. Um, and so I'm thinking, okay, who are my key people in life and, and what's going to happen as I get older? So what I hope you walk away from this presentation with um, is, again, a new way to think about some of these issues and some new tools in your toolbox um, in order to have these conversations. So, in order to have this discussion, I did prepare an agenda. And um, I really feel as though it's hard to have a conversation about all of this without putting it in the context of what's going on in our current healthcare system. So, we are going to talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act and some of the really revolutionary changes that are going on on the ground in terms of how we are accessing our care. In order to talk about the Affordable Care Act, I have to talk about health care trends that led to the Affordable Care Act and trends that are continuing as a result. Um, that'll lead us to um, some pictures of models of health care delivery and, again, how that's all changing. You can't talk about any of that without talking about the changing payer system because it is all intertwined. Um, this will lead us to some end-of-life scenarios that I'd like to walk through with you because to Marjorie's point, it is not one decision, it is often numerous decisions that need to be made um, as people are approaching the end of their life. Um, so I brought some case studies with me for, for us to discuss. Um, and then I want to leave you with some strategies about how to manage um, your own health care, health care of those that you love, and how to have some of these conversations. So if at any point um, in the conversation you want to interrupt me and ask questions, I'm perfectly fine with that. So please go ahead and do so. <coughs> So the Affordable Care Act, you know, the Affordable Care Act got a lot of um, press about um, only one uh, area uh, that was meant to address the health care of Americans. And that one area is the expanding the insurance coverage um, and to increase access for individuals. We in Massachusetts have been through this already, um, but across the country, you know, there's a lot of controversy about whether or not we should institute the Affordable Care Act and where we should start. I personally believe you have to have everyone in the pool and be sharing the risk um, in order to um, make any substantial changes in the healthcare system. So that was the one that got the highest billing. Um, but there were other things that were meant to address the healthcare of, of uh, Americans. And the 
second is improving the quality of care um, through innovation. Um, and there is a huge amount of innovation going on. And one area I think is worth mentioning is that uh, the Affordable Care Act has led to just tr a tremendous um, resources being placed at just you know mega data analysis, electronic medical records, being able to promote transparency, share data among various providers. So that's just one area of phenomenal innovation. When I'm coaching young people, I tell them the world of medical informatics is the world they should be going into right now. Um, another way is to enhance, again, preventive health. If we could prevent things from happening, again, you're going to decrease, um, you're going to improve people's quality of life, but you're going to decrease cost long, long term. And the last is promoting community and population-based activities. And what I mean by this is there is a lot of effort being made to look at populations of people, whether they're the Medicare population or populations in a particular physician practice, and we're looking at what some of their health issues are, and we're trying to address them um, in, in such ways. So for example, a whole practice looking at all of the diabetics that are in their practice, and how do we take one metric, like the, what's called a hemoglobin an A1C, which is a blood test you, uh, you, you do to measure people's blood sugar over time and the average of it. So how do we take this population of people, how do we do something new and innovative to take you know, a, uh, an average A1C that might be seven down to six? And what kind of savings could we have and what kind of quality of life could we have? So these are all the ways that the Affordable Care Act is really attempting to address the health of Americans. Oops. Okay. So, um, as an overarching theme in terms of all of the movement that's going on in the healthcare system, I would say uh, what's really happening is an alignment of incentives um, in order to change the healthcare delivery system. So, for example, um, if you um, if you are incented as a provider uh, to do tests because that's how you get paid. Well, is that test necessarily in the best interest of that individual? All of that has to be addressed. So what you're seeing is this tremendous sort of alignment of incentives among providers and among payers. Um, you're seeing, again, a changing payer system because the way that it's currently defined um, is that it's a pay-as-you-go system. Well, how might we look at that in a little more innovative way? Uh, maybe we would institute different payment systems that pay for different things. Um, I'm seeing a tremendous amount of promotion of the, what's called the Medicare Advantage plans. And if any of you have ever signed up for Medicare or dealing with people who are signing up for Medicare, there is an A, B, C, and D associated with Medicare, and the Medicare Advantage plans are the C plans. These are the managed care plans that people are buying from private insurance companies in lieu of traditional Medicare. I would say that the introduction of the Medicare Advantage plans has led to the most confusion on people's part in terms of what choices they need to make, but the goal is to manage the Medicare population a little bit more aggressively. Um, a lot of the Affordable Care Act really came out of the research um, that is called Practice Variation, and there is a center up at Dartmouth that started this research 20, 25 years ago. And it was fascinating, because what this particular physician looked at was he looked at, um, say, a woman at the age of 45 diagnosed with breast cancer here in Boston, um, who um, you know, had, maybe she had another sort of medical issue, and uh, otherwise she was relatively healthy. Um, and what he looked at was how was this woman treated? what kind of diagnostic testing was involved and what kind of treatment plan was laid out for this particular woman and what was the outcome of that. And he looked at that in comparison to what was going on in, you know, in, in St. Louis and in California. And what he saw and what became so evident is that there was incredible practice variation among uh, people of similar diagnosis and similar other sort of what we call comorbidities. And then he looked at the outcomes. And if you did more, did you get any better outcome? Well, not necessarily. So all of that research has really um, impacted um, or has gone into the development of the Affordable Care Act. But it also then led to what we call evidence-based medicine practice. 
So what that is, and you'll hear about that, is that um, you know, researchers from all over the world have come together and they've set up standard protocols for how a woman at the age of 45 who has a certain type of breast cancer based on the very specific pathology of her breast cancer should be treated. You know, should she have an MRI to look for metastasis before she undergoes treatment? Should she have chemotherapy? If so, what protocol? Should she have radiation therapy? If so, for how long? And so you'll hear a lot, and hopefully you're hearing these conversations with your physicians um, when they are making recommendations to you, that they are making their recommendations based on some standard of care called evidence-based medicine practice. Now, I like to use this picture, and I developed this picture. This is very funny because when I first started Health Assist, this was one of my first slides that I developed for my presentation. And what I was trying to demonstrate here is that our current model of healthcare delivery, um, or our previous model, it's changing, was really driven by the insurer. And my job is to really promote um, the influence of the client or the healthcare consumer who look, if you look, seems to be at the bottom of this picture. So the insurer is driving things by what they pay for. And then primary care physician and specialist in hospital, even the employer is all sort of, you know, almost beholden to what the insurer will pay for. And then the client's sort of at the bottom. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go along. So. Um, again, uh, payer at the bottom, consumer at the top. This is what you call a pay-as-you-go indemnity model. This is what I was referencing earlier, that um, if you are incented to do more, you generally will do more. Um, and if no one is looking at outcomes and the insurer is just paying for whatever you do, well, again, a little bit of perverse incentives exist here. Um, Standards of practice are not emphasized in this model, and you know, care is not at all coordinated. And if any of you have accessed the healthcare system, um, you know that um, it really needs some coordination because we access healthcare in a very segmented way. We might have our primary care physician here, and then we're referred to multiple specialists. We might have diagnostic testing over here. We might have treatment over here. We might then go to another healthcare system. And let me tell you, they do not all talk to each other. Okay. So, out of all of this came a new model of how we want to deliver health care. There are certain people, a person who just actually lost the primary, whose premise it was um, many years ago when he founded the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, was we need to blow up the healthcare system and we need to recreate it. And he's traveled all over the world looking at uh, ways other countries are delivering healthcare and uh, you know, really challenged the healthcare system to do things differently. So um, anyway, just uh, out of all of this came a new way of looking at how we even organize healthcare delivery systems. And so we've got what, what's called now accountable care organizations. And what I put up there is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid definition which is groups of doctors and hospitals and other healthcare providers who come together voluntarily to coordinate high quality care. And originally this was devised to uh, take care of the Medicare population and now it has been extended to the greater population. So the thought here was all of those entities that I just mentioned really kind of coming together to create a much greater continuum of care. Um, as a result of the development of this accountable care organization, you could then go to the payers, you could go to the insurers, and you could partner with them and say, let's maybe look at some alternative payment structures, such as global payments for a population of patients that you're going to manage. And maybe if we get some savings, we can share in those savings. So, so this is how the incentives are really being re, uh, really challenged and then realigned. Now, out of that also came a new model um, for delivery of primary care. And this model really came out of um, what pediatric, there have been a lot of pediat pediatricians and, and pediatric care that has been much better coordinated in the past. So this really came out of the pediatric community. But what has been developed, and you might hear about this, and you might hear about it in your own physician practices, is something called the patient-centered medical home. And again, the health and human services definition is a model of the organization of primary care that delivers the functions of primary health care, which should include comprehensive care, patient-centered care, 
I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Coordinated care, accessible services, and all with the thought that quality and safety should be at the forefront. Anybody here a member of a patient-centered medical home that they know about? Okay. You might not even know it. Um, my practice, uh, the practice at which I receive my primary care, is a patient-centered medical home. It's a large, you know, 500 physician uh, group practice up on the North Shore. Um, and I can tell you that the changes that are going on with that practice are really exciting to me and, and really revolutionary. Now, we've got to have, we're also experiencing, we're in the midst of this changing payer system as well. Um, a lot more movement towards what we call consumer-driven models of payment. And this is where risk is really shared with the members of a particular insurance organization. Um, this is where you might uh, be uh, offered high deductible plans, you might have higher co-pays, higher co-insurance. Not only is that occurring for many of us who receive our insurance through our employers, this is what's going on in the Medicare community as well with the promotion of these Medicare uh, Advantage plans. And what you'll, if you really dig deep, um, and most people don't, you'll see that for med many of these Medicare Advantage plans, you still have to pay an additional premium and you might have a high deductible and you might have increased co-pays and co-insurance um, and um, you might have a pretty high out-of-pocket maximum. Uh, my father is a great example of a person who thought he was never going to get sick, signed up for one of these Medicare Advantage plans, and when I really looked at it, it was before I started Health Assist, I said, do, do you know you have a $10,000 out-of-pocket maximum, so if something catastrophic happens to you, are you self-insured for that $10,000? That was a little eye-opening to him, so he rearranged his budget. He tells me he's never going to get sick, but we'll see. <laughs> um, the changing payer system is really also being changed to look at what's called value-based reimbursement system, meaning, again, patient-centered. You're going to hear that a lot. Paying for quality and outcomes. So remember that example I gave you about population health management? Well, if you take a population of diabetic patients and you get that A1C from 7 to 6 and you actually um, achieve a certain amount of savings, well, should that, be sa that savings be shared between the physician practice and the insurer? That's where value-based um, uh, reimbursement systems, uh, that's an example of one. Um, so paying for quality, paying for outcomes, and um, actually, you know, um, taking money away if you don't meet those particular quality standards. So again, global payment structures are all being looked at. Okay, so here's my patient-centered model. And again, I developed this slide about eight years ago about how I work with clients, which is really to put the client at the center or the patient at the center. And we should all be sort of cogs in, you know, in the wheel around um, a particular patient. I usually put the family right around the client as well. But then you've got all of these entities who are involved actually in people's care. And how should we be asking? The first question we should be asking is, what's in the best interest of the patient? Um, other players in all of this is people age, are professionals, some of you like yourselves, so attorneys are often involved in all of this. Um, you might have financial people involved, trust advisors involved as people are aging, and we all have to work together um, really as a coordinated team as we're helping people along this, what I call the continuum of life. So we've got the consumer at the center of the equation, a very coordinated approach to uh, care. Um, care is easily accessible in these models. Quality and outcomes are measured. Standards of practice are considered, and they are employed. Um, global payments might be employed, and end-of-life wishes are coordinated. So here we're going to move into a little bit of the end of life part. So one of the things that really excites me about, again, moving towards the medical home model of care is that end of life is being asked about and talked about much more um, in the setting of the primary care physician practice than I've ever seen. And I go to hundreds of primary care physician appointments with clients, so I get to almost do, I'm, I'm not doing a scientific study, but I'm doing an anecdotal study. But it is coming up um, more often than not. They're asking, do you have a healthcare proxy? Who is it? Do we have a copy of it? Um, and um, so, and, and we'll, when we get to some of the case examples, I'll tell you how this is playing out. So, as Marjorie said, um, even though
know, you might have your documents in place, and I hope you all do. It's a, star it's a starting point. Um, and you can't possibly imagine all the scenarios that are going to come up. And so if you haven't had the conversation um, with yourself, about yourself, with your family members, with someone you might have entrusted with the responsibility to make decisions for you in the event that you can't um, make them for yourself, if, if you haven't had those conversations, it's going, it might leave you um, experiencing things you didn't want to experience, and it might leave your healthcare proxy in a very uncomfortable position to have to make decisions for you based on what they think you want. Um, so here are some things that come up all the time, real life on the ground. And many, some of you might have been through this already with family members, but one of the things that comes up all the time, especially with older adults or with people, people with progressive chronic illnesses, um, is, you know, do you want to be a DNR? Well, do we even know what that means? So, you know, a DNR, so it, this often occurs when you're in the hospital, right? So now you're kind of in crisis mode because you're already in the hospital. And, you know, the emergency room physician is having to make decisions right away and they're asking questions. Who's the healthcare proxy? You know, is this person a DNR? Well, a DNR means do not resuscitate. So in the event that your heart were to stop, um, do you want to be actively resuscitated via use, the use of chest compressions and CPR, um, or do you not? Do you just want to let nature take its course? Um, this decision gets really complicated at times, especially when you're dealing with older individuals who are incredibly frail, and you can almost hear their ribs cracking you know, as they're doing chest compressions, and then to what end? Another decision that often uh, is asked about, especially in the hospital setting, and I'll start out with the hospital, then we'll get to home, um, is do you want to be intubated? Well, people don't you know, generally know what intubation means. So what this means is we've discussed your heart, but what if your breathing stops? Do you want us to insert a tube into your throat, down into your trachea, and attach you to a respirator? Um, do you want to be intubated? And again, you have to think about that. Well. If I thought I could get better, I probably might want to be intubated. But if I'm 95 years old and um, think that I could be intubated, but what happens after that, maybe not. So this, this is another topic that comes out. So you'll see in hospital records, DNR, DNI. The third one is a little more gray, because now we're getting into the community. So we've got a person at home, again, who might be quite ill, might be older. Um, and we get to the point sometimes where we're asking the question about, do we want to ever hospitalize this person again? What I see over and over and over again in some of my older adult clients, and I define them as over 80. They like that because they're only adults until they're 80. But when they, they're over 80, I call them an older adult. Um, so in my older adult client population, um, what I often see is we're doing okay, you know, we're acting in a preventive manner and people are home and they're having a pretty good quality of life and then something happens and the crisis occurs and oftentimes it's the fall. It's the broken hip which now requires anesthesia, an operation, pain medication, in the hospital totally disorient, you know, totally disorienting to time and then you see this person just spiraling downward. So they were doing okay, but they were kind of fragile. And now a crisis occurs, and again, they're spiraling down. And now you're in the hospital for four or five or six days, other stuff comes up. Um, this is when you often see someone who might have a little bit of underlying dementia, that dementia really exacerbating. You might see them have a real decom decompensation in terms of their cognitive level of functioning. Now you've got this person who's been in bed, they've been immobilized, and now we've got to go through this long process of rehab, probably move them to what's called a skilled nursing facility, another four, six, eight weeks, um, lots of PT, OT, speech therapy, you know, geriatric psycho psychiatrist involved, managing medications and all of that. You might think, can this person really go back home? You might have to make alternative living arrangements. So all of this is happening. Um, and so I've had this with my clients happen not once, not twice, but numerous times. And then families get to the place where they say, 
I don't want my loved one, or the person says, I don't ever want to be poked, prodded, stuck. I, I never want to go to the hospital again. So how do you deal with that? So another decision that might come up. So I've had people who are um, a status of do not resuscitate, do not intubate, do not hospitalize. Um, and I've had people who are do not resuscitate, do not intubate, but hospitalize. Um, so, you know, depends. A lot of gray, a lot of discussion, lots of conversation needs to go on over time. Once you get to the place of a do not resuscitate, do not intubate, do not hospitalize, the next natural question is, should you be on hospice care at home? And again, another trend that is occurring that makes me very happy is that um, you know, a lot of hospice organizations are even changing their names now to change their sort of brand and image because we all think of hospice at that last, you know, about hospice, that last week or two of life. Um, when people will come into the home and will care for individuals and it's a whole different philosophy of care, very patient-centered, all about comfort. Um, but what I'm finding now is that um, I have many clients who are in that older adult category who meet the criteria for hospice care at home long before it's imminent that they might pass. And, um, and therefore, now all of a sudden you're in a very different philosophy of care. You're not going to intubate, you're not going to, um, excuse me, you're not going to resuscitate, you're not going to intubate, you're not going to hospitalize, but we're going to really support you at home to have the best quality of care you can possibly have. I've had several clients, and, and we'll get to some of them, um, that, that that has played out nicely for them at home. Sometimes you get to a place where um, hospice was devised to really wrap around the care that family, uh, family would give individuals at home. Um, it's not 24-7, you know, it's, it's a few hours per week. When you think about 24 hours a day, you, know, you might have one hour of nursing care and maybe a social worker coming for an hour, well, you've got 22 other hours you have to deal with. Um, and so oftentimes families, you know, they have to go through all kinds of gyrations in order to care for their loved one at home. Sometimes they can't. And so then you move into maybe an inpatient hospice environment. So I want to tell you about Mrs. A. Think about all the things I told you about the Affordable Care Act as well as the end of life stuff. And let me tell you about Mrs. A. So she's an 88, uh, she wasn't, when I met her, an 88-year-old Medicare recipient. Um, she had had about 20 hospitalizations over the last 10 years, most of which had been in the previous three years to me coming on board with her. Um, she'd had multiple admissions to skilled nursing facilities, so she was that client that I was just describing to you who would go through these long protracted illnesses and every time she came home, she came home a step down. She would never kind of went back to her baseline. Over time, she kind of was giving up on walking. She just refused to even try anymore. So now she's um, at home um, and immobile. Uh, she had multiple comorbidities. So she had some uh, beginning well, I'd say she had moderate dementia when I met her. She had hypertension, she had diabetes, she had some eyesight issues, um, severe depression in her life that was really manifesting as a part of her dementia. Um, she took over 22 medications, which is very typical for my older adult, adult clients. Um, she had a primary care physician and multiple specialists. Um, and she was in that category that everyone talks about when they talk about health care. She was in that 80% of cost from 20% of our Medicare recipients. She was very expensive. She is expensive to keep going. Um, the good thing about her, and the reason I like to use her as an example, is even prior to the Affordable Care Act, when those trends were going on, um, she became part of what was called a Medicare demonstration project, and this went on in 2006. And this was a partnership between Medicare and healthcare providers who have now moved into being accountable care organizations and employing care through a medical home model of care. She was identified based on all these criteria, again, in that most expensive category. And what Medicare did is they did an experiment. They gave this healthcare entity, this, this accountable care organization, and this physician practice money. And they said, you care for this patient which, whatever way you think is best. You be innovative in terms of how you care for them. And if we see results in terms of decreased cost, we'll share that, we'll share that savings with you. And so the Medicare demonstration projects that proved to be successful actually led to the development of accountable care organizations and global payment systems and on and on. 
But the good thing about Mrs. A, and the reason I bring her up, is what this practice did with that money was they decided to incorporate, they, you know, physicians, they were driven by numbers, right? They only make money if they see patients. So they were driven by numbers. So all the extraneous things that they might think about this patient needing, they didn't have the resources to do. So with this money, they actually changed the practice to incorporate some new professionals and to begin to work as a team. Let me tell you, this is revolutionary in the mindset of a physician. Physicians are not ever taught to work as teams. So what's going on is really exciting. Um, they've been rewarded for individual achievement their entire lives. They don't necessarily look to others. But what happened as a result of this is they decided to employ a, um, a social worker in the practice, a key person, a pharmacist, to take a look at those 22 medications. Um, and a case manager. Case manager is usually nurse prepared and is really taught to look outside the walls of the, um, of the physician practice to say, what might be going on with this individual outside of here? And how can we better coordinate her care along the continuum? I have to credit this, this was prior to me working with Mrs. A, but this social work, so they met as a team to talk about this patient. I mean, this is revolutionary in healthcare, I'm telling you. This just does not go on. They met as a team, especially primary care practices. It might go on in more specialized care like cancer care. Um, and this physician was angry. He's like, where is Mrs. A's family? This woman is failing at home. Her husband is failing at home because they were a husband and wife team when I first met them. Where is her family? And, you know, I don't think that she can succeed at home. I think she needs to be in an institution. And this was his attitude. So, Again, a revolutionary thing happened. The case manager called the son, who had been defined as her emergency contact, and initiated a conversation. You know, we'd really like to talk with you about your mother and your father, um, and we, we, we have concerns. We have concerns about her cognitive abilities, their ability to succeed at home. We think that many of these repeated hospitalizations are as a result of not having adequate care at home can we talk to you about that? Well, he's in New York, sister's in Western Mass. Um, question came up, who's the healthcare proxy? Is there one? Well, Mrs. A and Mr. A were each other's. Both of them had pretty intense dementia. Might this be a time for change? Anyway, the long and short of it is, um, as a result of that conversation, um, let's see if I have, did I? Yeah, let me tell you about the changes in, in uh, care for Mrs. A. Um, it was defined that she really didn't need all the specialists that she was seeing. Um, her primary care could do most of her care. Um, there was a medication review by the pharmacist. I mean, they got rid of a few medications. They say that after you're taking seven medications, your chances of a medication interaction, a negative medication interaction, is like 100%. So she was on 20, 22. Um, the nurse case, case manager conferred with the children. They initiated some home-based care, that some of which was paid for by Medicare in the form of what we used to call the visiting nurse organizations. They're called different things now. Um, but what was really clear is that in order for Mrs. A and Mr. A to really succeed at home, they needed more care. They needed private care in their home to help them with the activities of daily living, to help them get out of bed in the morning, to help them clean themselves, to eat, all those kinds of things. So that became instituted, and that's when I came on the scene. Um, the, the son sought me out and said, I'm in New York. My sister's in Western Mass. We really need someone to coordinate more of her care. And then what we started to talk about for Mrs. A um, is her quality of life. Um, so I've been with them now for three years. Mr. A passed away about a year and a half ago. Uh, but let me tell you that I have watched Mrs. A go through suffering suffering physically and suffering emotionally, uh, where she was significantly depressed at times, she would be crying all the time, she was in severe pain. Um, and so we, get, we began to have these conversations about the quality of life for, uh, for Mrs. A. And over time, this didn't happen in the beginning, but over, at, at one point she was, a, she was not a DNR or a DNI, and she was a hospitalized. And over time, we have come to the place where decisions for her are that she's a DNR, she's a DNI, but she's still a hospitalized. So just 
three weeks ago, um, Mrs. A, who'd been doing so great, she hadn't been in the hospital for a year. Um, she developed um, a, a GI infection called C. diff, which is so awful for these older uh, individuals. And she went to the hospital, and it just was so much easier this time because everyone knew um, what we wanted. Um, and, uh, you know, it was touch and go there about whether or not she was going to overcome this. But, but we, we were able, to, we were all on the same page. That's all I can say. And she's back at home, and she's doing okay. Again, another step down. Um, but, um, but at least we have these provisions in place if things were to happen. Okay. Okay, so um, what I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a little sort of summary here, but then move on to some other case examples. So, you know, what I hope, again, you take away from this presentation is that it's really important that you have a really positive relationship with your primary care physician for yourself or that you're involved in the primary care relationship between um, you and, and maybe someone you're caring for, that you integrate yourself into that relationship because that's where conversations can occur. Um, people ask me all the time how you overcome the um, confidentiality requirements and, and of course, or provisions, and, and of course, my clients all have to sign a HIPAA release form. But when I'm talking to, um, to people about their parents, I'll say, ask your parents if indeed you can you know, have access to your healthcare information and then put that in writing. Um, I can give you my form, you can get a form online. Oftentimes the physician practices already have a form that you can sign. And now you've taken away the administrative barrier for you to be able to have conversations with the physician that are of much greater quality. You need to understand the insurance coverage. You know, that's always out there looming because decisions get made oftentimes, you know, as a result of insurance coverage. So it's really important that you understand that. I think for individuals, uh, we all as healthcare consumers should maintain our own medical file. We can get things online now if we have patient portals. So if you do, I highly encourage you to use them. And again, if you're managing the care of someone else, um, gain access to that patient portal with their permission, and then you can have just much more information upon which to make decisions. You can communicate with physicians via email. There's just a lot more that goes on um, as a result of some of these innovations. Um, you should go prepared to all physician appointments with an agenda. So when I go to physician appointments for myself or my clients or my parents, I've got a written agenda which gives us control of the meeting. You know, I wouldn't have come here today without an agenda. Why do we go to our doctor's appointments without agendas? And let me tell you, when you go in with an agenda and you hand it to the physician and you say, I prepared for this meeting today and here's all the things that I want to go over. They're shocked, first of all. Secondly, they really appreciate it because they see where you're coming from. They might add to the agenda because there are things they want to go over as well, but you have a lot of control because you can say, mm, did we go over all my agenda items? Let me summarize what we decided here. So you shouldn't go to an appointment without an agenda. An end of life discussion can be something that's easy to kind of bring up when it's written down on the agenda. Um, you should identify a care partner. You know, we all need care partners to attend physician appointments with us. Studies have shown that people remember very little um, out of a discussion, especially if um, there's bad news that's being discussed. So as a care partner, I would say, you know, I say this to my clients and you could do it for your family. My job is to come to help, a, my job is to help you prepare, so we go in prepared. My job is to be a silent um, scribe I'm the note taker. I'm writing things down as we're talking. My job is to think of the questions you might not think to ask while you're very actively listening to the, to the physician. Um, so I'm going to be quiet for most of the appointment and then I'll jump in maybe at the end. Um, so we all need care partners. I tell that to my husband all the time. He doesn't want me to come because then I hold him accountable to those cholesterol numbers, you know. Um, but, um, and we need to initiate conversations about end of life care. So these conversations can come from many different directions. They can come from you as the care partner. They can come from you as the patient. They can be initiated by the physician. But begin the dialogue, no matter who starts it. Um, but include the physician. If it's you that wants to start it, really look to your physician as your partner in this discussion, whether it's for yourself or for someone you care about. 
and then, um, and then of course, initiate appropriate documentation of your, your end of life um, wishes. So I want to tell you about um, I want to tell you about another client of mine. So this is Mr. A, not not married to Mrs. A. This is a different Mr. A. Um, so this this is a, a, a great example. So he was 89 years old when I met him again, a Medicare recipient. He had been in the hospital for a total of, hospital and rehab for a total of six months when I met him. Very severe cardiac issues, cardiac failure. Um, and he was, uh, he was managed very, very carefully to get him under control. Um, and when I met him, I met him two days before he was about to leave his rehab environment. The social worker there said to the son, who was a, who was a physician, who lived in, where did he live, Tennessee, you know, I really don't think your dad, he's, he's going, he lived in a, a continuing care retirement community, but he lived in the independent portion of it. And uh, he wanted to go home on his own. He was cognitively intact, um, but the social worker said, you know, I'm really concerned about him going home. And so lo and behold, I came on the scene, and it was obvious to me this man could not go home by himself. He really needed care. And literally, by being with him for a couple of hours, when we got home, I realized he needed 24-7 care, primarily because he had been in a controlled environment for six months, they were controlling his fluid intake, his salt intake, his food intake. This man was thirsty and could not become satiated. All he did when he got home was keep going to the refrigerator to eat and to drink and to eat and to drink. And before you knew it, he was going to be out. Of, he was going to be in congestive heart failure again. So we brought in 24-7 care for him and basically barred him from the refrigerator so we could manage his salt intake and his fluid intake and his food intake. But he had multiple um, other, other medical issues. You know, he had vision issues, he had severe hearing issues. He was pretty feeble by the time uh, he came home. But again, cognitively intact. And he was pretty cool because he was, a, um, he was a retired executive from a pharmaceutical company. So when I walked into his apartment and saw the 75 bottles of medication sitting on his counter. He knew exactly what every single one of them was. But when I looked at his med list, which had about 25 to 30 medications on it, I had to reconcile all of that. That particular action is where a lot of care falls through the cracks when people transition from one environment to the next. But anyway, we got them all straightened out. So it was decided that uh, we were going to transfer his primary care. So he used to leave his facility and get his primary care at the Brigham, I think. And his cardiologist was at the Brigham. But he was at a facility called Newbridge-on-the-Charles. And so there is on-site primary care there. And so we decided we were going to transition his primary care to one of the physicians there. So I went with him to that first appointment. And I, the physician who did this is no longer there. But she sat down and she said, hi, Ms. Day, how are you? You know, I'm your new primary care physician. What are your goals? And she just left it. And he kind of looked at her. And she, he said, you know, I don't ever, ever want to go to the hospital again. I've just come out of six months of being in the hospital. I don't ever want to go to the hospital again. I want to live in my apartment, my independent living apartment. That's what I want to do. Um, I'd like to play bridge every now and then. And I'd like to go out here and there. And so. What happened as a result of that is we had a very frank discussion about how we were going to achieve his never having to go to the hospital again. She brought up the subject. Now, I, his, I had met his son briefly once. I didn't know the other son. He was in Thailand or something. Um, I didn't really know this man very well. But she brought up the conversation. And it led to, you know, maybe what we need to talk about for you is hospice care so we can support you in your home. Um, and we can carry out your wishes. So um, that's what we did. I called the son and said, what do you think about this? And he's like, well, I, I think that's what my father wants. I am his healthcare proxy, but I'm not sure if I've really had you know, conversations with him about this. But if he said that's what he wants, I think that's what I want too. But it, it was so interesting because it came from the physician. And it doesn't often come from the physician quite so frankly. And um, this man lived for a year 
I mean, I believe he lived for a year because we were never going to take him to the hospital again. And because we were never, you know, our goals became comfort. Our goals became good quality of life. We played around with his medicines and we had to. We wanted to keep his congestive heart failure under control. We didn't take away, maybe we took one or two of those medicines away, like a cholesterol med. Okay, he's a DNR, a DNI, do not hospitalize on hospice care. Do we need that cholesterol med? But um, we maintained all of his medications to maintain his heart function. Some really wonderful things went on in that year in that the hospice organization was doing a, um, a project. Uh, they were videotaping uh, individuals who'd been in World War II and recording their stories. And so he was involved in that project. And, you know, so I was so happy when Mr. A, you know, he slowly declined. And you know, I thought, sure, at some point in time, he'd end up needing to be in. A, we had to revert to a hospital bed. That was hard for him because his wife had designed the bed. So, so we took his headboard and put it behind the hospital bed so he could feel like he was still in his own bed. Um, but I thought, sure, we were going to have to institute oxygen and all that kind of stuff. And one day, he got up and he had breakfast and uh, talked to the caregiver, who we loved. He loved these ladies who took care of him. And um, he sat down and he died. And so I look at that and say, that was a really nice experience. That probably sounds perverse. But when you're in this business, you really think about these experiences and saying, how can we have a good experience? His children had just been here for all of the holidays. They had not spent uh, the Jewish holidays together in 20 years um, because, you know, everyone had their busy lives, but they had all just been here. Um, and it, it was a really nice experience, and it really resulted from that physician saying, what are your goals, and kind of leading him down that path. Let's see. So let me tell you about Ms. J. So Ms. J is a client that Marjorie and I shared, actually. Um, and uh, this was a 62-year-old woman with a progressive neurologic disease. Um, and when I met her, she was um, in a wheelchair. She could move her hands a little. She had a tracheostomy. Um, cognitively brilliant. Um, but this disease, this neurologic disease, had really taken away really everything in her life. Um, she lived at home with 24-hour private caregiving. Um, she had family, but they were around, but not super involved in her, in her life. She had a very good friend who was a huge advocate for her, but who lived um, far away. And um, what we found out is that uh, she had outlined her wishes, correct? Right? Sorta? Well, not until you got involved. Well, she knew what she wanted. Let's just put it that way. Um, and what we had to do is really formalize all of that. She knew she never wanted to go to the hospital again. She knew she didn't want any form of resuscitation. Um, she knew that she wanted to pass. You know, I believe she was also quite depressed as a result of all the loss in her life. Um, so with Marjorie's help, her documentation got in place. But what she hadn't done was shared any of this with her healthcare proxy, who was her brother. And so I had to ask her permission. You know, when, I, when we realized that, I said, you know, would it be okay if I asked your brother to come here? And we actually had a conversation, again, a conversation about what it is that you wish, because you might have defined what it is that you wish, but if you end up in the hospital or whatever, and he has to make decisions for you, he doesn't even know what it is that you want. Um, and so we had that meeting, and um, you know, and I have to say that, he was very relieved afterwards. He, he felt this tremendous sort of burden in some respects as her healthcare proxy, uh, not because he didn't want to do well by her, but because he really didn't know what she wanted. And so, you know, with some coaching, I, she was able to articulate what it is that she wanted, get it in writing, and share that with her, uh, with her brother. And so based on all of that, you know, we too instituted hospice care for her so that she'd never be hospitalized. And she too had what I call a lovely passing. She kind of fell, you know, died in her sleep. The care, it was shocking to the caregivers, but she, she died in her sleep. And again, I put that in the category of success. Um, in terms of people's passing. I think I have one last one for you. Mrs. M. Oh yeah, Mrs. M. So Mrs. M was one of my early clients and uh, when I met her she was 95 
And I was introduced to her through her elder law attorney because she really had no family close by. She had two nephews who lived out of state. And um, she uh, was in a nursing home at the time that I met her. And um, this attorney said to her, what are your goals? And uh, she said, I want to go home is what I want to do. She's 95. So he asked me to figure out whether there was any reason she couldn't go home. And when I looked at her, I mean, she had a lot of things to manage, you know, healthcare things to manage, but there was no reason she had to live her life in an institution. So we brought her home. She interviewed caregivers. We hired 24-hour living caregivers for her, and we brought her home. And at the time, um, she was, I believe that she had spoken with her uh, attorney, had a power of attorney, had a health care proxy, um, and she had said, I want to live to be 100. Um, so when he probed a little more and said, uh, what about if you have health issues? She said, well, if there's a chance I can get better, I want you to take that chance. So that's what we were sort of dealing with with her. Um, so, but she did say, I don't think I want to be um, resuscitated if my heart stops. She had said that to him, but that wasn't what came up for her. So she was still hospitalized, and um, I got a you know, call one day, went in and, and uh, figured out what was going on, and the physician said to me, I think I'm going to need to cardiovert her. So her heart was in a, a different rhythm. It was, she was in an atrial fibrillation. It was probably going to lead to congestive heart failure, and he's like, you know, I really think we need to defibrillate her. And I'm thinking, all right, what category does this fall into, right? So it's not resuscitation, it's defibrillation, and is this what we want to do? So, of course, I had to call our healthcare proxy, make sure the three of us were talking, and he needed to make the decision for her based on his conversations. So he decided that he was going to go forward with that defibrillation um, if it was needed. I actually felt differently. I'm thinking she's 97 at this point in time, you know, and I could see her declining in various ways, but it wasn't my decision to make. He was the one who, who talked with her, and uh, she said, if I can get better, I, I, I want to get better. So he made the decision that she would be cardioverted if it was necessary. It wasn't, and I was really glad, and we got her back home. But as things went on, her respiratory status really started to change. So I was the one who initiated a conversation with her primary care physician to say, if she ever had to go to the hospital and if she were intubated, what do you think the chances of her, uh, for, of, what, are you, what are the chances that she might be able to come off the respirator? And she said less than 5%. So with that information, the attorney was able to go back and, said, and have another conversation with her about, all right, now you're 98. You define those wishes at 95. You're 98. You've lived three years now at home as you wished. What do you want to do now? And I remember her, she had these big blue eyes, and she turned to me and said, what do you think would happen if I went to the hospital? And because she was having these respiratory issues. And I said, you know, they would have to put you on a ventilator. And, you know, I talked to your doctor. You were there. She couldn't hear very well. But I said, you were there. And the doctor said, chances of coming off would probably be 5%. You know, is that what you want? And she said, no. So again, we reverted to hospice care for her, but it was all about these, these conversations and these conversations that occurred over time. Um, so again, it's hard to know what you're going to be faced with when you are preparing some of your documents. So I am going to summarize now so that maybe you can, we can have some dialogue and some discussion. Um, so um, in summary, what you can see is that you know, there's a lot of change going on in the healthcare system, and I, I do feel really encouraged by many of the changes that are going on because conversations are occurring and coordination is occurring. Um, so this change is going to continue as you see the alignment of, of more and more incentives. Um, what you're going to see in the general uh, sort of, you know, in our communities are more high performance networks. We're used to networks. We're used to the partners healthcare system and the, the BI Deaconess healthcare system and the steward system and the Leahy system. We're used to all of that. But around the country, you're seeing more and more high performance networks coming together to create accountable care organizations and to develop this medical home model of primary care. Um, we're going to see more and more care in less expensive settings. One of the things that we didn't talk about in some of my case examples is really balancing the financial decisions along with the medical decisions. So Mrs. A, that, the first Mrs. A that I told you about, you know, Mrs. A has resources, right? 
But right now, Mrs. A has two full-time caregivers because she decided she didn't want to walk anymore, so she doesn't walk. She didn't want a lift in her house to get her out of bed. She can't stay in bed. Um, her caregiver cannot be responsible for lifting her alone. So, you know, she's paying for two full-time caregivers, probably costing about over $200,000 a year to care for herself in her, in her home. Not everyone has that resource. So oftentimes you find yourself weighing not only the, you know, the, the wishes of your loved one um, and what you might wish for them, but also what about the financial responsibility and the financial burden? Where is it going to lie? Um, so that really factors in, and it, it, again, I'm often dealing at the intersection of all of this. So I'm often dealing with the attorney and the accountant and the trust advisor or whatever as, as a lot of this decision making is going on. What resources do we have? The other complication that comes up sometimes is when the healthcare proxy is one person in the family, but the um, power of attorney managing the finances is another person and they don't agree about spending money. And so that's been, those scenarios have certainly come up. Um, so again, your wishes need to, to, be, to be defined <laughs> amongst the individuals that not only will be making healthcare decisions for you, but financial decisions for you as well. Um, so we're gonna see care in, in less expensive settings, needless to say, because we're really driving care into the community. We're gonna need less hospital beds in the future. Um, consumers are, are bearing much more of the financial responsibility and the responsibility to make decisions for themselves. Evidence-based medicine, what happens when you go to the doctors now, and some people aren't prepared for this, is the evidence is presented to you here are your options for treatment for you know, your particular type of cancer. You decide. Um, and that's a little hard you know, for people. Some people say, well, I want my physician to decide. Well, you decide. And, and I, run into the, I ran into this recently, it drove me crazy, um, with a, a client who I felt as though really should have a vaccine for herpes zoster. You know, really kind of compromised, older adult. Her physician presented her with the data and said, it's up to you. She didn't want to have a shot, so she didn't get it. And her husband didn't either, and he came down with shingles and a really bad case of shingles. So now she's going to get the shot. But this is what I mean by evidence-based medicine. Um, so consumers are bearing more responsibility. There is greater transparency in the system. There has to be in order for all of this to change. We as healthcare consumers have to have access to our information and our data um, upon which to make decisions. And end-of-life planning is going to occur more proactively. We've talked a lot about how it occurs in the hospital um, and at home. The other scenario that comes up all the time is the acute hospitalization and someone with no documentation, with no one to make decisions, physicians move forward with cure. So people are resuscitated, they are intubated, and now they're in the ICU, and there's no viable chance that they can have any quality of life, and now the family is presented with that data, and now they have to make decisions to withdraw care. Much harder sometimes than to not initiate care in the beginning. We experienced this in our own family. I lost a 39-year-old cousin um, who, had a, uh, who had a massive seizure at home. She didn't have any of her documentation in place, and she had a long-standing history of alcoholism. And as a result, she'd been in and out of rehab, and as a result of her attempting to stop drinking at home, she had a massive seizure. So her mother, my cousin, faced with the decision for a 39-year-old daughter who was basically brain dead, who had two children, what are we going to do? Um, I would say that end-of-life planning, the facility in which uh, she was uh, being cared for did have a pal palliative care team, and again, this is another sea change going on in hospital-based care. So physicians who are trained in end-of-life care came and spoke with her um, in addition to the physicians who were caring for, for her in the ICU 
to really talk not only about what was to be expected from her medically, but how do you deal with the emotions of having to make such a decision, and how do we help guide you? Um, you know, we're here in the mecca of healthcare, so we're very progressive in terms of having all this. Sometimes I'm coaching people across the country, and they're in more rural settings, and no one's heard of palliative care. You know, so we've got a long way to go about all of that. But I am seeing that end of life is being addressed and discussed much more proactively. So, so I'm going to stop here now and just ask if anyone has any questions or comments or wants to share stories. Yes? I just have a question. So uh, Mrs. A's example of the two caregivers, and it seemed like a staggering number per year. But then I started thinking about it. And so if she was in a nursing home, what would be the, I mean, and I know there's different levels of nursing home and different levels of care in that, but the number would have been equally as staggering, I assume, or? A little less. A little less. A little but, less. But if she had one caregiver, probably comparable, right? Um, probably comparable. Generally, actually costs a little more when you've got private caregivers at home. Uh, depending, you know, in her scenario, um, we were able to employ a 24-hour live-in caregiver that we paid a per diem rate to about $300 a day. And the only reason we were able to go that route is because she sleeps at night, and so the caregiver can sleep at night. Now, I'd say we, we were taking liberties with that because more and more, Mrs. A would wake up at night. Mr. A, she was taking care of two at one point, one caregiver, two individuals. Um, and uh, if Mrs. A progresses to the point where you actually have to have someone awake all the time, then you have to move to an hourly rate when you're hiring private caregivers. And around $25 an hour, you're more up in the five or $600 range in terms of um, paying a caregiver. And then you also have all the other expenses of maintaining a household. So this caregiver is amazing because she runs this household. And this woman was used to a very nice lifestyle and being catered to a little bit. So you know she has the, the best of everything. So there's a lot of resources going into maintaining the house. We have a driver. You know, we have someone doing the lawn. We have me. You know, there's a lot of other costs that are involved. So if she were to move into a long-term care facility, it would probably be a, a bit less. And again, that's what's being weighed sometimes. Mrs. M, uh, the one who went home, who was 95, um, she already, so here's what happened when, happens when people don't have a care partner. So she had been hospitalized for shingles, <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, and um, had to go to rehab. So she went to a short-term short rehab environment. There was really no family around, so everyone just assumed she couldn't go back home. And so she reverted to long-term care. So Medicare pays for short-term, doesn't pay for long-term. So now she's paying out of pocket for long-term care because she had some resources. Um, and, when, and really, the only reason she couldn't go home was because there was no one to coordinate what she needed at home. That, that's what she needed. So, um, but when I talked to the attorney, so it was 95 when I met her, at 98, he said to me, all right, I did five years of financial planning for her, <laughs> right? And, you know, she might reach a point when she can't afford this anymore. You know, so he was weighing all of that as, you know, my job was to keep her as healthy as possible and ha happy and having a good quality of life. He was considering what the cost was going to be and what was going to happen. And he had a plan, you know. Um, so, but, you know, she was 98. She'd used up a lot of resources. Yes. You had described in that first case with Mrs. A making changes to suit her evolving needs, even even under perhaps a layer of dementia or, you know, as that increases, I mean, how do you, how do you deal with making changes when someone is suffering like that and maybe not cognitively able to make some of those decisions or have those discussions? Like, how, how do you proceed with that type of change? So really, you know, starting with the, the primary care physician and the primary care physician practice. But what was key to Mrs. A and what is key to so many of my older adult clients um, are two things. One is a physician, I have a bias that people who are older should be cared for by a specialist, and I say a geriatric specialist, because their mindset is different. So for Mr. A, the physician who asked him about his goals, she was a geriatric trained physician. 
Mrs. A's is not, but he has a large population of older uh, patients in his panel. Key member of her team is the geriatric psychiatrist. Um, she really needed specialist care. She was significantly depressed. I mean, there was a period of time where she just wouldn't stop crying. Um, and she would lash out, and she wouldn't allow the caregiver to take care of her. So it was, again, careful discussion about quality of life for her. She might be demented, but how do we get her to be a little more happily demented? That's a conversation I have with geriatric psychiatrists all the time. Um, and indeed, we developed a, a nice cocktail of medication that over time, she did get better. Now, I can't tell if she got better because the dementia has progressed to a point where she's given up control, so she doesn't resist anymore. I think that's part of it, but I also think that the medications, she's, she's more pleasant than I've ever seen her in her life, you know, <laughs> um, for whatever reason. And so, and that happens sometimes. For others, it doesn't, and, they're, and they are suffering emotionally. Uh, which is just heartbreaking. You know, I had a, another 95-year-old lady who, you know, was reliving her Holocaust experience in, in her dementia. And again, we had to get specialists in to say, you know, we need to deal with this and deal with this aggressively. Even if she is a DNR and a DNI and a, and a DNH, you know, she's suffering. Um, and I have to say that the hospice team is well equipped um, often to help with some of that titration of, of those medications. Yes. And what are your thoughts on um, long-term care insurance? Uh, do, you, do you think it's a good idea? When do you think people should consider it? Yeah, so long-term, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a very personal um, sort of conversation. Uh, what I feel responsible to do is to let people know what the cost of care is when they move out of that Medicare realm and they move into that private realm, whether it's in, in um, a long-term care facility or they have services in their home. And, you know, I want them to think ahead and I want them to plan and I often will say this is something, you know, you really should have a conversation with your um, your financial planner and maybe your attorney uh, about um, because this should just be factored into the greater plan because you could be dishing out significant amounts of money um, over you know a three to five year period sometimes and are you prepared to do so so if people can afford it um, I think it's a good idea there are sometimes there are people who are so wealthy that they say well we can self-insure for that you know um, but I really encourage them to have the conversation and I feel a responsibility just to educate them about what it's about and that um, and I use the example of um, so I had a client whose, uh, whose husband was um, dying from brain cancer, and uh, she had 24-7 live-in at the end of his life because she really wanted to care for him at home. No, it wasn't live-in because they had to be awake because he was up every two hours. Um, and so she was dishing out $600 a day only to discover that she had a long-term care policy that was a 300, which is very lucrative, $300 a day um, benefit that he well qualified for. And so that was of great reassurance to, to her because we didn't know how long this was going to go on. So I, I bring it up, I talk about it, I talk about what it is. Um, people's perceptions of it still need to change. They still think about it as for nursing home care. And I have to explain that no, it also um, covers in-home care if you meet the criteria. Um, so that, that's the way that I usually manage it with my clients. Could you talk a little bit about how your practice is set up to, when you engage with a client in terms of, um, kind of are, are you hired for a specific period of time? Are you hired hourly for consultation purposes? Any and all of that. <laughs> so generally, um, so this is the way I don't like to be hired. <laughs> and I'll tell you how I like to be hired. I usually get called when families are in crisis because mom or dad has fallen, they're in the hospital, and everything is spiraling, and you know, and, and they're being, this is how they describe it, mom or dad's being pushed out of the hospital. And I don't, and they're talking about these, these you know, rehab environments, and I don't understand any of this, and I, I don't know what to do. And so I have to really rally <laughs> and act very quickly. Um, people generally engage me, and they engage me uh, at an hourly rate because um, I never know where that's going to go. Um, so I generally have to you know, quickly do the contract, quickly do the medical release form, get to the hospital, talk to the doctors, look at the medical records, talk to the case manager, and plan for discharge. So 
so that like is all happening sometimes within two days. Um, and then we get to the next environment, and again, whenever you go into a, a healthcare environment, a hospital or rehab environment, from the point of admission, you should be planning for the discharge so that you're not caught off, gu off guard. Um, and so, um, so the minute you know, uh, the person gets to the next environment, we're starting to talk about what's it going to take, you know, what's the projected amount of time they're going to be here, what's it going to take to get that person home. Are they going to be able to go home? Do we need to change their living arrangements? Do we need to add care for them? Um, is going home with, um, you know, traditional VNA services going to be enough? So those cases, they just, sometimes it can take six months for people to kind of get stabilized and then I start acting in more of a preventive manner and I go to all the doctor's appointments and I coordinate, make sure the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, communicate with the family and you know all that kind of stuff. So that's that scenario. Other scenarios I really like is when I get called and um, they say, you know, um, I'm going to be having, I had a client who was coming from Hawaii to Boston and she was going to have a knee replacement. And she said, you know, I think I might need a little help uh, because I am coming. In with, and oh, by the way, I'm on dialysis. So she thought this was going to be sort of a piece of cake to come to the Baptist to have her surgery. And I was like, oh, no, there's a lot of planning that's going to need to go on here. And so I did a lot of pre-arranging with the hospital about how they were going to handle the dialysis, where she was going to go for rehab, how that was going to be handled. So that was a more controlled setting. So for the first scenario, I continue with those people generally, generally, if families want me to, on and on. Um, the other scenario was really an episodic event. She had her surgery, we got her through all that, and then she's moved on. So it comes in, in different ways. Yes. Uh, have you been involved in situations where, because the person doesn't have the right documentation in place, or even if they do, they, they, there's a guardianship that's considered, and what is your role in those scenarios? Yes, I've been involved in a, in a few of those scenarios, and I've been brought in often from protective services because these patients have ended up in protective services and they've had someone assigned. Um, so I come in as the neutral healthcare person to really decipher, interpret, and understand what's going on with this person medically. Um, so I've been involved in, in that capacity, um, sort of, um, it, it, they're, they're hard scenarios, really hard scenarios. So I, I've worked for the Protective Services Agency. I've also been on the other side where family has brought me in because protective services was called because the care of their loved one was called into question. They lost some rights, but they wanted to assert as many of their rights as possible. And one of the one case, the only way this woman got visitation with her loved one was because I was on the scene. And again, I was going to be a neutral party uh, to be able to represent reality about what this person's capacity was. And here was a very sad situation of a woman who wanted to care for her loved for her partner of like 40 years. And she couldn't physically do it anymore. Um, he had frontal lobe dementia. He had outbursts of behavior. He'd been abusive to her. Um, but she didn't want him to end up in an institution. So he, what, the reason it ended up in that direction is she eventually had to call 911 one time. And it was determined through blood work and muscle breakdown um, that he'd been on the floor for about eight or nine hours. And she couldn't get him up anymore. You know, So it was a very complicated situation. But, I always go in with a very objective, <laughs> you know, I had to really work with her to say this, you know, this, your loved one's going to die and he's, and he needs to be in an institution. You can't manage his behaviors anymore. He needs to be on psychotropic medications. He was abusive to you, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. So you mentioned two scenarios, uh, crisis, episodic, what about preparatory? So let's say you have a, an 85 year old client or family member, um, nothing's wrong with them, but you're pretty sure nobody knows what's going on with them medically or you know, who their doctors are. Does anybody have a release form to talk to the doctors even? So do you, ha how do you organize that? Yeah, well, someone has to bring me in, right? So someone has to introduce me. But I love those, and I do have several of those. And, and I love when we get into that preventive mode because it's very gratifying. But um, 
And oftentimes, again, it might be a professional like yourself who might bring me in or the attorney might bring me in and really is trying to get this person to be forward thinking about what might be coming down the pike and how can we just make sure that we are acting in as preventive a manner as we can to keep you healthy, to keep you independent, to keep you in your own home, all of that. So I will generally go in and, and sometimes I do this as just um, a standalone product. I'll go in and do a very thorough assessment. Um, I generally gain credibility when people realize I'm a nurse. Even though I'm not practicing as a nurse anymore, they tell me everything, you know? They let me in their medicine cabinet so I can see the 30 meds that are in there. Um, and they generally will share with me what's going on with them. And sometimes I have to piece it together. So I'll say to them, okay, what medical conditions do you have? And they'll say, oh, not very many. And then I'll say, well, let me look at your meds. And then when I look at their meds, I'm like, oh, I did this the other day. Oh, you have gout? Oh, it looks like you've got um, some heart disease. Do you have high cholesterol? Looks like you've got pernicious anemia. I could tell all that from the medications. He, this person thought that they were, you know, had nothing. So from there, I do a very uh, thorough written assessment sometimes for that individual or the family or whatever. And from there, we decide whether or not I'll remain involved. But I often will say to people, let me come to your doctor's appointments with you because what I'll help you do is, um, consolidate the information at the end and develop an action plan and make sure that that action plan gets executed. So things like, you know, you go to the doctors and the doctor says, I really want you to have that herpes zoster, you know, that shingles vaccine, but oh, by the way, we don't give it here. You've got to get yourself to CB CVS because that's where they give it. Well, who makes sure that that happens? You know, those kinds of things. Okay? Yes? Once you get this down on paper, is this safeguard from your uh, health proxy you can go to. They can't change it at the end. Like, what if you are unconscious or you know, the person is unconscious and they have a DNR, but the person is too, the health proxy goes, I don't think I can do it. Is that safeguard once you have any paper? Like, is it binding? It, it helps a lot. Marjorie, I don't know if you want to add to any of this. It certainly helps a lot. It, and sometimes it's somebody like me who's talking to the individual, sometimes it's the physician. If the physician knows that someone's plans have been outlined, if they've been documented somewhere, um, the physician might be able to challenge that individual. This is when you bring in the palliative care team because it's really about the discomfort of the now healthcare proxy and their feelings and their emotions about all of this. So, you know, you really have to work with that person to get them to be comfortable to really help execute the wish. Yeah, I, I was on a panel once with the ethicist from, uh, I think it was Beth Israel, and it was quite uh, surprising to hear on what happened on the ground when I'd been telling people for years that, you know, if you don't have a healthcare agent, they're, they're going to have to get a guardianship, and some judge is going to decide uh, what your treatment should be. And in real life, apparently, that doesn't happen, for, mostly because it takes a long time. But what he said, which I thought was really interesting, is that they make every effort to get all family members or, or close, uh, you know, pe people who are close to the patient to be on the same page. And it's only at the very end, if those people can't agree, that then they look at, you know, who is the actual proxy because that's the person who's going to, you know, sign this consent. So actually that made me feel better about things because uh, because I think they really do try to work with families and help the agent sort of get to the point where they can make the decision. Exactly. That's what I've seen on the ground as well. So right, well. it looks like a lot of us yeah. have had to leave. Um, I want to thank you all very much for coming. And I also want to thank Joanne uh, Thoreau, who's our marketing director, for pulling this all together. She really did a great job. And we're having two more programs, one in October, and actually Doug, one of our speakers is here, and he's going to be talking about a, a similar concept about bridging the gap is how we think of it, between what your legal documents say and what really happens in, on the ground. And he's going to be talking more about financial assets, passing on a family business, or maybe passing on a vacation home, and how to coordinate conversations between you and your family so that, you know, what you're hoping will happen in the future with future generations is what really will happen. And in November, we're having um, two speakers who are going to talk about your actual personal legacy. 
And I found, look, if my clients don't usually have too many things to complain about me, but one thing that they complain about is that these documents are so dry and they really don't express like what kind of person I am and you know, what my values are. And that's another thing that I can't really put in someone's documents. I mean, I can say to them, you know, write a side letter of your wishes, you know, how you want your trust to really be administered, but you can't sort of gobble up that legal document. So um, the two speakers who are coming in November are going to talk more about that, about your personal legacy and um, how you can have what's called an ethical will, which is really an expression of your values. And the other speaker is going to talk about, he actually has a business where he will, you know, create a documented either family history or small business history, um, either in the form of a video or it could be a book, where um, the grandchildren will find out that, you know, this, their grandfather like, came over on the boat with two dollars in his pocket and started out shining shoes and then ended up building this empire. And how did that all happen? And, um, there's stories that often get lost, and we're uh, hoping that we can help people, you know, not have the story get lost. So, thank you very much. Thank you.